The year is 1995. I had not yet been born into this world, and the latest Berserk chapter hit Young Animal magazine titled Thousand Year Fiefdom, the 53rd chapter of the series. This chapter in the Golden Age arc sees the Band of the Hawk go through the Tower of Rebirth in order to rescue Griffith from torture. During this expedition, the fairy tale of the Skull King is discussed. More on that later. And here we are, almost 25 years later, with a chapter Phantasm, literally meaning illusion, which begins to sow some of the seeds that we saw in Thousand Year Fiefdom. The chapter begins at the tail end of 361 with Hanar, the dwarf who created the Berserker armor, smacking the armor to invoke its power. I swear I say this on every chapter analysis I do, but I love the motion and how alive this page feels immediately. From the spark line of the Berserker armor clamping down, which shows the forcefulness of the immediate action, to the harsh lines around Guts, signifying the speed of how he's reacting to this sudden transformation, struggling and needing to get out of this trance. Miura then continues to hammer home the Mad Dog persona that Guts has shown throughout the series through these next actions by Hanar. Hanar smacks his hammer again, saying what I assume to be very casually, down boy, like he's restraining a wild beast instead of a human being. A bit of a tangent, but this actually reminds me of Guts' comment to Ganeshka in Vratanis. When Ganeshka asks Guts to join him, Guts says, screw you, I'm purebred human right down to the bone, don't mistake me for one of you freaks. Guts' defining trait in his struggle is that he's a human fighting monsters, and it requires every bit of his willpower to get through the days. But when he's in the Berserker armor, this defining characteristic of him is gone, and he embodies what he's fighting against, beasts. So Hanar's comment treating him like an animal reinforces this both to the characters in universe and the readers. We're not meant to celebrate this berserker form, despite it looking cool as hell, but it's something honestly sad and the destruction of Guts' ideals of how and why he fights. Moving on, when the clamps restrain Guts from Hanar's second clang, I love the motion of a clamp swinging around Guts' body such as on his arm here. It makes the page spring to life and reinforces the forcefulness of this action, with how such powers require to restrain a beast such as Berserker Guts. I also love Gedfring barely giving a shit about what's going on, he's just like, eh. I remember a common complaint of Elfhelm being too light-hearted, which I always thought was kind of a silly complaint looking back in retrospect. From Casca's dreamscape alone, the Wicker Men being imprisoned souls, the dude who made the Berserker armor and Skull Knight's armor, that being Hanar, and there being a literal curse master on the island. It's a nice way to remind the reader that Elf Island isn't entirely separate from the dark cruel world of Berserk that we knew before this point, and hell, they most likely facilitated some of it. Gedfring not flinching at all is a testament that the residents of Elfhelm are pretty badass. This next page is the setup of the juiciest part of the chapter. Shuriken and Morda question Hanar of what exactly he's doing to Guts, and Hanar explains, just figured I'd show him one a blood memory that seeped into the armor. This quote has extreme importance to chapter 227 of the series, when Guts first dons the Berserker armor in his fight against Grunveld. When Shurke and the others see the armor reinforcing Guts' broken limbs with its still teeth, Shurke makes the following comment. I heard the previous owner of the armor was similarly devoured by its still teeth, as he continued fighting, until the last of his blood gushed forth from where his bones were broken. Attentive readers who remembered this quote can probably connect it to what Hanar said, and figured out that the blood memory we are going to see are the previous owner's last moments in the armor, Skull Knights. With another clang of Hanar's hammer, we see the first vision of a memory, a sprawling hellish landscape much like any other horrific ceremony we've seen throughout the series, be it the Count summoning the God Hand, the Eclipse, and the Incarnation Ceremony. There's so much detail on this page that I'd be here all day if I was trying to pick up all of it, but the first thing I notice are how the tentacles are drawn to the hole, like that's the source of this horrific scenery. It gives me very heavy sea god vibes. More about the hole. At first I thought it was similar to the Vortex of Souls, but then I decided to go back and read a conversation that the crew had with Flora about the astral world in the Falcon of the Millennium Empire arc. Flora explains the astral plane and its various layers, there's the interstice, where people such as the Branded exist. There's a deeper layer where gods, demons, and angels exist, dubbed as the Profound Layer. Deeper in the realm there are concepts of heaven and hell. But the absolute deepest layer is the abyss, where one can never return. Look at the panel of Guts reacting to Flora's explanation of the abyss, and then let's compare this to the panel in Skull Knight's memories. I don't want to go into much theory diving, 
but the fact they look so similar leads credence to the fact that this memory is happening in an extremely deep layer of the astral plane. We've seen this imagery before in the Count's second journey in this sacrificial ritual, but the fact that this hole is a lot more focused in the imagery makes me feel like it's important and we're in a much deeper level than the profound layer. Other little details I love in this panel are the eyes lying in wait and five shadowy images standing on a podium in the background of the scenery. Although it's not exactly the same as the Hand of God imagery we saw in the Eclipse, the fact they are elevated on the podium signifies their importance in this event. The next page is separated strip by strip of demonic creatures whose eyes we saw in the last panel coming out to attack the Skull Knight. At first I thought this was an Eclipse ceremony, but after studying this page, I'm not too sure. Notice how the monsters are almost identical in design. Like these almost furry individuals calling out on the first and second strip look identical. The creatures with a singular eye look identical to each other on the third strip too, which signifies to me that they are part of the tentacles, again much like the sea god, rather than their own individual apostles gathered for an eclipse ceremony. I love this first person perspective on the fourth strip of the page, of Skull Knight mowing down these creatures, with blood splatter almost taking up all of his vision. But look what isn't obscured, these shadowy figures that he's getting closer and closer to. I love the visual storytelling here, that even under the influence of the Berserker and Skull Knight's path being forged in blood, the only thing that is still clear to him are the visions of these figures and getting to them. This next panel has risen up to be one of my favourite in the series and is the standout for the entire chapter. We see a clear image of the shadowy figures, Void standing among four others, what are assumed to be the God Hand. The first one I want to talk about is this little fella here. Let's go back to chapter 53, A Thousand Year Fiefdom. When Charlotte is explaining the Skull King's history, she mentions that Supreme King Geyseric was someone who managed to establish an age-old empire, whilst no one knows what country he came from, or when or even how he raised an army. Look at the design of the headplate for Geyseric's horse. It looks extremely similar to the god hand that we have in the Skull Knight's vision. It's very likely a crackpot theory from myself, but let's assume Geyseric's armour here isn't from Midland, but hails from the unknown country he could potentially be from. It could be that this god hand hails from the same area and chose their form to resemble this visual piece from their culture, like how Geyseric has it on his horse here, and much how like Rakshas's mask appears to symbolise Kushan culture. The one on the left is pretty cool too. Not much to say about him apart from the fact I like his design. He reminds me of a mix of Ganeshka and Grunbeld, Ganeshka face-wise and the spikes at the top looks like Grunbeld's dragon crystals. The one on the far right reminds me a bit of Maleficent. I really like the scaly spiky nature of this design. The one next to this one is perhaps my favourite of a bunch because of how abstract it is. I'm not going to go for the low hanging fruit of what his face looks like, but what I will say is I love how it doesn't have any distinguishable facial characteristics. It doesn't have eyes, nose, a mouth, or anything. Again, it's just so abstract compared to the rest of them. I'm just sitting here wondering how it would even communicate. I love it. In general, I love how abstract these assumed god hand are compared to the ones we know and, uh, love in the story. Biura has somehow managed to provide some excellent designs, which demonstrate the ancient evil vibe very, very nicely. They could very well be based off real world legend and folklore, but unfortunately I don't know enough about that to comment or what I would even possibly need to research. If anyone knows, please comment below, I'd really appreciate it. Let's go back to the main boy himself, Void, making his first appearance in the series since... September of 1996? Oh my god, probably before a lot of people watching this were even born, and confirming the age-old theory that him and Skull Knight in fact do have a history. This panel I think is meant to mislead the reader that this is an eclipse due to similar visual motifs used in the Golden Age, but I'm not so sure. Let me explain. Let's go back to the fairy tale of the Skull King from the Golden Age. As explained by Jado, Geyseric gathered workers from all over the Empire and forced them through hard labour to build a large capital city, whilst the king lived in luxury, he enforced heavier taxes on the people. God finally decided he couldn't condone the Skull King's deeds and sent five angels to erase the city by lightning and great earthquakes. This is what is assumed to be the eclipse that Geyseric is involved with. This is backed up by the bodies we see in the Tower of Reaper with the brands etched in their foreheads. But I don't think that's what we're seeing in Skull Knight's memories. 
Casca mentions that the legend she heard mentions four angels, whilst five are present here in Skull Knight's memories. Unless someone like Void was just invoked into the God Hand much like Femto was. Along with a point I made earlier about these potentially not being apostles we see, but an extension of a tentacle creature, leads me to believe that this isn't an eclipse. The next page, we cut back to Guts reacting to these memories. Gedfring mentions that the current memory that Guts is witnessing seems to resonate with him. Of course, this is because it's extremely similar to the horrors of the eclipse. I adore the visual of Guts breaking free from the chains. I love the motion of the page with this little panel here, showing the chain links slowly breaking away. It even takes Hanar off guard. Guts looks at his hand which invokes another memory. Skull Knight holding what appears to be a woman he cared about very deeply. The look in his eyes are haunting. It reminds me of the same look that Guts gives when Skull Knight gives the omen, your wish may not be her wish, all the way back in the Falcon of the Millennium Empire arc, one of terror and hopelessness. I've said this in previous videos, but Miura is a master at conveying emotion through eyes, and this is no exception. The fact that there's no words here and you can tell exactly how Skull Knight is feeling purely through the visuals, Miura never ceases to amaze me. The next panel we get a look at the woman that Skull Knight is holding. First thing that I notice is that she's branded on her shoulder, so she is a sacrifice for some form of demonic ceremony. Assuming these memories are in sequential order and not fragmented, this can't be related to Void becoming a god hand, as he already was a god hand in the previous panels, but again, this is only an assumption. Her jewellery is very reminiscent of Geistrick's armour, and helps inform that she was someone of wealth. The way he is gripping her, and how she looks at him also tells us that they cared about each other deeply, most likely a lover. What is interesting is that this winged elven design on her is slightly reminiscent to the one on Scar Knight's horse. What could this mean? Is this just a visual motif from Geyseric's time? Skull Knight was paying homage to her? Or could it be that this woman was the horse all along? That was a poor joke, by the way. The final panel in this memory shows Skull Knight's vision being obscured by blood, the woman dying in his arms and a most terrifying sight, the brand of sacrifice being displayed in a blaze of fire. Now I wonder what imagery this reminds us of. That's right, the incarnation ceremony in the Conviction Arc. Before we get onto the Incarnation Ceremony, I want to talk about these final two panels with Skull Knight's vision getting obscured with blood. It's almost identical and probably homage to when Guts loses his eye in the Eclipse. Both are similar situations too, with the final thing they see is someone they care for deeply being taken away from them, with unspeakable horrors serving as a backdrop to an already devastating tragedy. I guess the only difference here is Guts lost an eye while Skull Knight straight up died with Berserker armor shredding every last piece of him. Let's go back to the blazing brand of sacrifice. In the Conviction Arc in the chapter Fierce Believer, Mosgus tells the following tale to Farni. It's said that a sage once imprisoned in the tower by Supreme King Geyseric continued to proclaim the sins of the king to God, in the midst of every possible torture, until in time an angel was made to descend. It's a very popular theory about Void as the sage imprisoned in the Tower of Conviction, but the phrasing that Mosgus uses is deceptive. From a first glance, it could be gauged from this that Void's initiation in the God Hand, and therefore an eclipse happened here, but that's not consistent with what we know. For one, the fairy tale of the Skull King which we heard about in Golden Age was said to happen in Windham, the capital kingdom of Midland, which isn't where the sage was captured, he was in the Tower of Conviction in Albion. Mosgus' word don't directly mention multiple angels or hands of God either, just that the sage told of Geyseric sins to God and then an angel was made to descend, just one. The phrase made to descend strongly suggests, at least to myself, that this was an incarnation ceremony a thousand years ago, as I interpret this as the angel descending onto the earthly plane being given a physical form. And if we assume that the sage is void, it couldn't have been him as he was not a god hand at this time. My understanding is the incarnation ceremony gives an existing god hand physical form. Unless Mosgus is actually talking about the eclipse. This legend is a legend for a reason. It's left purposely vague. So although we saw a flaming brand similar to the incarnation ceremony, I don't think that's what we're seeing here. And although the imagery of the memories and the fairy tale of the Skull King suggest an eclipse, 
along seeing the woman being branded, which could be any of the above, plus an apostle ceremony. I don't think it's them either, but something unknown. I don't want to go too deep into theory crafting, but I'm curious to see what everyone thinks. Please leave some comments below because I love reading all of these ideas, or could you say, ideas of evil. In this next page, Guts.exe stops working. The hollow imagery of the armor is extremely apt for what Guts just saw. He witnessed Skull Knight's worst memories and his eventual death. Even for a second, Guts is experiencing the hollow show that the Skull Knight we know and um, love is now. When Shuriken goes to bring Guts back to his senses, we have some really intense imagery. When Shuriken grabs onto the ears of the armor, it startles her that they're suddenly gone. She is witnessing the final memory of a Skull Knight. A hollow and dead berserker armor remains where the great king Geyseric once stood. This is where Geyseric died, and where the Skull Knight was born. Everyone is allowed to make fun of me every time I say the word motion, but I'm going to say it again. I love the motion of Shuriken grabbing the ears, and them disappearing when she sees the final memory, the black bubble around the panel signifying this. You can feel the intensity of the action because Shuriken closes her eyes when she grabs onto the armor, so when her grip slips, the reader feels the tension as she opens her eyes and sees the final vision, as she expected it to match reality in the physical world. We can see this when Guts comes to his senses, because Shuriken is gripping the ear, this action just wasn't transferred in the astral world. It's also a nice touch that Guts has fallen to his knees, the horror of the vision so great that someone even as seasoned as Guts could barely handle it, and as he puts it himself, that right now, for sure, was the end. The final page of this chapter leaves us with some haunting words from Skull Knight. What you bore witness to was the end of a foolish king, and the beginning of a dead man stalking the endless night. This quote is very poignant and devastating, a huge theme of this chapter is regret. Skull Knight lost everything. His kingdom, someone he cared about deeply, and even his own body and sense of self. And how does history remember him? As the Demon King and the King of Galloping Death. Legends depict heavenly angels smiting down everything he built up for his cruelty. Supreme King Geyseric, who imprisoned a sage, someone who is known to be profoundly wise and have ultimate judgement. Geyseric is gone. We don't know how much of these legends are true. It could be he was a cruel, malicious king, or it could have been fabricated and exaggerated. But what we have in his place is a hollow suit of armor. A dead man who is only focused on revenge, for not being able to prevent what he could have possibly caused all those years ago. Regrets of a foolish king. Thanks for watching.